Fresh off the Nebraska Girl State Wrestling Tournament, Dr. Rob Zaniska is wearing his girls. Nebra- it's, a, it's my daughter's club team t-shirt, so <laughs> Nebraska Wrestling Academy, NWA. You, your voice is gone. Dude. It's gone, dude. Just gone. Well, I, I think I, we were talking earlier. I've been hanging out with like, I don't know how many thousand of my closest friends for the last three days in, in the CHI center screaming bloody murder. Yeah, so I think wrestling is a quiet sport from oh, a spectator man. standpoint, is it? You know, and it's it's state sports, and state is always, whatever the sport <laughs> is, it's the freaking best. Because yeah. the whole school shows up, the whole town shows up. It, it's just, it's a madhouse. God, I, I love it. I love it. Well, the cool thing about wrestling is, and we should introduce our guest today. You know, we <laughs> I, I, had this, I had this big, eloquent uh, introduction for Cleet Blakeman, former Husker quarterback, now NFL referee, but he just jumps right in the conversation because <laughs> he's not messing around. We've, that's, all, that's, we've all known each other I, for how long? I mean, I, so you and I think we go back, back. Yes, we, indeed. You and I go back to I think ninety four. How long have you two known each other? About the same time, or um, you know, because you were, I mean. Yeah, with the law we, thing, you were—I think you—you you had that going, but you were doing the officiating thing. And I'm trying to remember: were you still officiating when it was the Big Eight? No. Okay. I came in the Big Twelve. Okay. Um, I was. But, a, but I, was a big I, I can even backtrack from there, though, Rob. For you was because I used to go down and uh, well, wa- Coach Osmer would have officials come in and work, yeah, work for practices. all the scrimmages so and practices. During that time when I was just doing high school games and around here and small college stuff, I would actually go down to Lincoln and would work practices also. And then like even in the spring, you know, the spring um, time with, 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 you know, all that, we would work practices, we'd work the spring game and everything else. So that, we go back. Which to we always practices. appreciated that. It was always, <laughs> which for us, it's good practice because, I mean, it's always one of those things where you'd hit a guy, you'd latch on and we'll, Hey, did you see me in that last play? Was that holding or not? <laughs> and I'd say, so. yep, yeah, it was. <laughs> but but that was great. No, talk about learning grounds for me too. Yeah. It was it was just great because you know, high school doing the small college stuff because I was working back then in that time was doing like Doan College, Hastings, Concordia, Nebraska Wesleyan games and all that stuff. NAIA, and then but going down to work in Division One football like we had the opportunity just to see. Different levels, different speed, different skills. It was just it was so for me as a as a an official, it was great learning ground, basically. You know, I first met Cleet, it was a high school game. It was nineteen ninety four, it was Berkwist Stadium. I remember where I was. <laughs> And we, we just struck up a conversation because you were friends with Tom Zenner at the time. And I took Tom Zenner's place of Fox 42. Right. Uh, and right. You still hang around with Tom at all? No, he's he's up and he's over in California okay. somewhere. Yeah. I'll hear from him every now and then. Just random. Uh, but you and I struck up a conversation then. And I, I, I gave you time to prepare for this question because so, you and I have been seeing each other lately at uh, Marion High School basketball games where I do the – I'm the public address announcer for Marion High School, Rob. I didn't know if you knew that or not. I very very impressive, I Rob. did yeah, tell you. Yeah. So it's, uh, Trav, Trav's kind of a big deal. <laughs> People well, I knew it when I first walked into the Marion game and he was there. I'm like, oh, this is a big thing. You don't mess around. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I don't this know about that. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't. I don't quite know about that. But I, I I'm just going to jump right in. And by the way, Cleet is a red wine drinker. Rob is drinking a, a triple IPA, and I'm drinking a uh, about a th- triple shot of Breckenridge bourbon whiskey tonight. Yeah, I was going to ask, what do you what do you rock? 105 today? proof Breckenridge. So aged yeah. well, huh? Yeah, is I, it out of Colorado? Yeah, it's it's out of Breckenridge oh. Brewing Company. There we go. I just got a bourbon from Traverse City Brewing Company. It's pretty smooth. Up in too. Michigan. Yeah. A, a, a yeah. guy sent it to me. But since you met Rob, you know, you know, doing those games, I met you during high school games, and, and you're doing the National Football League now. I asked you this the other day, and I'm just going to jump right into it. When is the most fun you've had officiating? Because I brought that up to you, and I, I gave you almost a week and a half to think about <laughs> it now. So, <laughs> <laughs> now, are you asking this in the sense of, which level was yeah, the most yeah. fun? I mean, because, or you know, when you're doing what? There was this one game, this one time, no, no, and that was the I'm asking level because at high school, it's just you're doing it because you love the sport. You're doing Concordia and Dana and, and, and Midland. You're watching kids that just want to play football, right? Which actually, because my brother John started yeah. off as an official, and he did high school and small college for several years until his son got old enough that, my brother, Matt Hoskinson, a handful of other guys got together and started coaching them. And that, that's what kind of pulled them out of officiating 
was yeah. moving over and coaching youth football for the better part of a decade. But he he loved it at that level. Like, yeah, it's just, it, it happens to a lot of guys, frankly. It just you know, there is a transition. There's a commitment time and everything else. You talk about Trav, but but getting back, I guess, to your question, because you always said because <laughs> once it became once you got in the Big Twelve and then the National Football League, then it becomes a job. Then it becomes like a, a much bigger commitment than doing high school games or, or right. don't. Right. Right. Exactly yeah. right. And that's the distinction between what's what's fun and what's a job, right? At the end of the day, I will say this. I enjoy what I'm doing, officiating-wise. From, from day one, I knew I was hooked. And now I'm 35, literally 35 years later, that was one since I started officiating, is where I am now. And I still love it. So it's just, you know, at, there's different levels. The higher you go up, the more consequence every game carries with it, right? I mean, it's just, it's just that much more. Um, not to say you, you try harder at that, but you got to be, you got to just got to be tuned in and locked in on everything as you progress upwards. So the NFL, love it. I still love it. 15 years. And, uh, I get, I still get those, that adrenaline rush on Sundays, especially Sunday morning, waking up going, man, it's game day, right? You know how that you'd wake up on a Saturday oh, yeah. ready for an oh, afternoon game. You think it. it's game day. You just, it was just a different feel, a different day. And I still get that every weekend. And that's what I'm – the day that I don't feel that, the day that I look in the mirror on a Sunday, you know, getting ready to go to, to Chicago and work a game is a day I probably should say, Cleed, you probably had enough. It's that time to go. But I'm not, I'm not close to that yet. I don't know how many more years I got. But the, the answer to your story is – question ultimately is I, each level for me has been unbelievably fun, unbelievably awarding. And it just has been a, a great ride so far. 35 years worth. Was, was the NFL always the goal? No. Uh, the goal, initially when I got into it, because the backstory on this is my dad was a high school football official and basketball official. And in, in uh, his real job, he was, a, he was a golf pro at Norfolk Country Club where I grew up. So he was a club pro there. In the fall, he'd work football. And in the winter, he worked basketball. And then when I finished with my eligibility down in Lincoln, which was the fall of 87 was my last season. And in the fall of 88, I was planning to enroll and go to law school. So that was rolling around. He's like, well, why don't you just come? This is the fall of 88 now. Why don't you come and work some high school football games with us? I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, why not? Hang out with my dad a little bit, get, get that experience. But literally from the first game, I was pretty much hooked to it. And uh, I didn't know where it would progress. You know, looking back 35 years later, I, would I say I'd be finished my 15th year in the NFL, worked a Super Bowl, a lot of play, you know, playoff games. No, you just never know where it's going to go, you know. No, when you went from so you were in the Big 12, that was that yeah. the first explain that process of going from that kind of that high school small college level to Big 12 officiating. Good very good question. So for 13 years I worked high school and small college. So and it just became something where I continued to work at it. Like anything, like any craft you've got, you know, you just continue to work at it. You want to get better and better and better. And that's, and I wanted to see literally how far I could go. My, my next, I always had the work in the, the level I was at, I always had an expectation or desire to move up to the next level, right? So I was working high school games. I started, next level was the small college games, NAI. I started working those and I feel, okay, now next level would be division one, just you know, go do it. And like we were talking about here, earlier off the air, the benefit I had was having basically University of Nebraska Lincoln being in my backyard where I could go work practices during the week, or drive, you know, after work, drive down, work a practice or two each week. And then in the spring, you know, the spring spring season when there's four weeks of, of, of practice and scrimmages. Had those and, Saturday and, scrimmages every week. Yeah, yeah. And, and back in the day, those were, I mean, those were like full out, it was football. So it, is there a call up to the big leagues? Like when you get that, when, when you made the actual transition to the big 12, what was that? So like anything is kind of like you get a, it, people start realizing you can work a little bit and it can, this guy knows how to officiate. He's got some talent, blah, blah, blah. So it just, and eventually I applied. I physically had an application for the big 12. I filled out, put it in. And then um, a few years later, they're like, okay, we're going to, I got, well, there was one year, and I believe it was 04, 2004, I was given one game in the Big 12, and it was Oklahoma at Iowa State. And what year was that? I believe, I think it was 04. 
Iowa State win that game? I'm trying to remember my my. I, I mean, <laughs> Rob funny. knows that's, what it's like to lose in Ames I mean, because Marv Seiler's still running down the sideline. I, I will admit, Marv is still running. <laughs> uh, I mean, that was Bob Stoops, Oklahoma. I mean, that was only a few. Yeah, that's true. The but that was fight. like that, that Seneca was, Wallace. I, I'm trying to think if that was Seneca Wallace uh, type of years or not. I, I my. You guys have had the CTE too, so I'm I <laughs> must have it as well. But I'm, no, because I, I I think because I got in the league, I got in the NFL in in 2008. And so I was in I was in the Big Twelve from one, or 2001 to, through 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 the 2007 season. So it would have been like 2000, 2000, 2000. All, all I remember is when you left the Big Twelve. Osborne was pissed. Remember just, that? Well, I just I felt like the quality dropped. <laughs> but there was a handful of guys that I always liked. I mean, it, it was, and I say this from a fan perspective watching the games. I'm not talking about as a player. I'm saying from a fan perspective, watching the games. Yeah. It's like, I loved, I loved watching you. You had Kelly Saulfield, another former Husker. I was like, yeah. Kelly, um, God, if some, some of these guys left officiating, I say left officiating, left the big 12. I thought there was a drop off. Now, maybe that's just me. Well, I, I think Osborne brought that up. Cause I, re I remember this. Remember he went out in, in the newspapers and he was pissed off because he felt that the Big 12 and the college ranks were not doing enough to keep quality officials around. But right. I also thought to myself, right. it's the National Football League, man. I mean, if you get the call up to, to the National Football League, what's going to keep you at the Big 12 or Big 10? Or, well, I don't or know any if anybody, anybody faults you on that move. <laughs> yeah. No, that's right. But T.O., that was his thing, too, is maybe because he I remember he cornered me one place. Uh, I don't remember, remember where, but he started, we started talking about just this subject. And he's like, do you think we should, to keep you guys around, the, the, what do he, he termed the better officials around, do we need to pay more? Do we need to do something else, you know, as a conference? And I'm like, you know, it, I, Trav, my reaction was simply your, kind of yours. My coach, this is the National Football League. I mean, everybody, everybody from the time they start playing uh, aspires to be the National Football League. And, and as a young official, for me, I'm like, that's that you know that was my aspiration at that point in time. So I don't there's, I don't think there's really anything they could have done to say stay that I would have said okay I'll stay. But yeah, it's interesting because there is the dynamic of you know the 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 limited flow of new and young officials into into all sports now. You're dealing with it in basketball, you're dealing with it in baseball, you soccer, and you know just the the limited amount of officials there are. Is football the safest place to be? Just because you're out on the field, yeah. I, I, I mean, I know parents are crazy. Yeah. But you go to a basketball game, they're batshit, right? And, and if you go to uh, an I, AU game, I mean, I think it's any any event where the parent has the ability to reach the ear of the ref, any sport. And that's benefit I have is I am I'm you know as an, as the referee, I'm out in the middle of the field, so I'm insulated by by seventy yards probably on each <laughs> side of me from just that kind of thing. But you, you know, but you hear it going up the tunnels. You know, it's it's uh, coming out of the tunnel before the game, going in the tunnel at halftime. You know, people just lean over and they just say the craziest things. You know, and at the end of the day, I'm like, okay, I don't take it personal. I you know, I tell my wife this too. I'm like, they're they're yelling at the hat, the whistle, and the and the stripes. It's just you know, that's what they're yelling at. It's not not personal, but it's just crazy how um, how parents and I, I say that because I'm like you. I'm sitting in the stands and at some of my kids' games, and they're young, and hearing, you know, parents complain and yell at the at the referee who's a 14 year old kid just trying to work, you know, a, a sixth grade basketball game. You know, John Higgins got attacked by Kentucky fans. Yeah. Have you ever had like rabid Raider fans? And I'm just showing Raider fans out there. Any other fan base call your law firm and just go crazy? Yes. Really? It happens a lot. It's shocking. <laughs> I tell people, it's amazing I, what people I'm, will Google. Oh, we're gonna go find this. You know guy. my and because because I'll I'll get you know I have a game Sunday back in the office Monday morning and receptionist. This is not every week, but she'll kind of come in and, uh, and uh, knock on my door. So uh, the game was somewhat kind of rough yesterday, huh? I'm like, okay, how many calls did we get? How many do we get? Well, because people will call in, get a, leave a voice message, and just you know accuse me of everything to the moon and back you I, save those you should I, save those <laughs> and then when you're all done because i am sure you got restrictions of what you can can and can't do as a, an official but like when you're done you just go here are all the voicemails i've had over the last 20 <laughs> years 
or what I have do, done is, is do like you know, a top ten. Yeah. Per <laughs> I get well. Here's a, I get a, I get asked to speak at different events here and there throughout town. You know, Rotary clubs, all that kind of stuff. And so what I've done, you know, you've probably seen like Jimmy Kimmel. They do the the um, mean tweets. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so t- <sighs> Google my name sometime on either Twitter. Usually Twitter is pretty much the one, but you'd be shocked at the stuff people write. Is there, just Google Cleet Blakeman, you'll find it. Because I don't. And so I've in, started to incorporate this into some of my speeches. I'm like, okay, you people think, you know, this is a glamorous NFL life, right? And everything's <laughs> all, all sugar. But I said, here's some of the things. So I'll run down, you know, I'll run eight or 10 of them. And people are just like, you got to be kidding me. No, it's like, no, it's just nuts. But. The, the, you know, the, the, it's, it's rarely do I get, and they're, they're, they're refreshing at times because will, I will get something that says, hey, great job. You, you know, as at the game yesterday, you and your crew did a great job. But, you know, 99 out of 100 of them are, you guys suck and, and you're a crook and how much are you getting paid for, you know, blowing the game and it's all fixed. And, and even worse than that, of course, beyond that, I can't get into it probably on this radio, but... Um, but it happens. You can say whatever you want, <laughs> as, long, as long as you're not violating. Yeah, if you, the rules if you don't violate your, your employee, yes, yeah. you can. You can, you, well, you, you, can you can drop the f bomb. Oh, you can yeah. drop the s bomb. You can say whatever you want. So let me just say, I could say all that on this on this air right now, <laughs> multiple times, because that's what we get. And but these I, people are just, it's crazy. That's good. That's why they call them fanatics, man. That's why they call them fanatics. But a lot of that rolls over to you know you sports now, where you haven't hard time finding officials because younger young the younger generation's just going, I don't need this for twenty five bucks a game or whatever I'm doing this for. I don't need this. Some guy, you know, three guys up in the stands yelling at me because I, I didn't call traveling. Well, you know, just it's just as bad. And it's across the board. And you know, like Higgins talks about too, when he did that he did a he did a Remember when he volunteered with his son for a yeah. ninth grade? Uh, I'm game? the one because I did the first interview with him. So yeah. th- that's the uh, he told the story on my radio show in Des Moines, and that's when it went viral, right? I mean, yeah. it went all over the place, I, and um, it's just absolutely amazing. And, and what, what's amazing is the guy who yelled at him had no idea who he was, which right. blows my mind away, right? It's like, <laughs> really, you've got a Final Four ref sitting here and you don't know who he is. But the fact, the way he reacted and the way the team reacted was, yeah, it, it was sad. It was just it was. It was, you know, for me as an official reading it, thinking, come on, you know, I don't, I just, it's just really frustrating. And I, and so you get to the point now where schools and athletic directors are just having a hard time finding, you know, warm bodies to, I know to we've, officiate. My son played high school football here in Omaha up through, uh, 21 was his senior season. But I mean, that was something that was always a little bit of an issue. And I mean, you occasionally, even, I mean, that was only a couple of years ago, year and a yeah. half ago. Yeah. I, I mean, you had games where you saw kind of these weird schedules where it's like, why are these two teams playing on a Thursday night? Because it looks like the stadium's available Friday night. And it's, oh, we don't have an officiating crew on that date because the, yeah. like the, the two crews that we normally would have had available are working two other games because they're just kind of a shortage everywhere. Yeah. So, I mean, we're seeing that at the high school level now. Yeah, and even like the Marion was like a 2.30 tip-off a week or so ago. Yeah. On a Saturday, like a Saturday at 2.30. I'm like, oh, it's kind of strange, but okay, fine. I don't know if it was a consequence. I do not know uh, if it was regular, the regular scheduled in or not, but it just is becoming really, really difficult um, at all stages to get good quality, you know, because it, it's, it's, it's an art, it's a craft that takes years to – to develop and and to get the knack of it and and really become efficient at it and really good at it. Um, And if you don't, if they're not giving it enough time, you know, they get in a year or two, the younger, I talk about the younger people get it now, a year or two and just say, I'm out, it's enough. Boom, then now they're gone. You know, and now there's there's just a slow wave of of this going downhill pretty quickly, frankly, in a way, in a way, you know, comparatively to where it, it needs to be and where it needs to be at and where it's at. You ever thought of running like the the Cleet Blakeman officiating camp for for one of the football officials? Can you do that? Can you like? Yeah, I could. I just don't have the time. 
<laughs> no, that makes it, sense. It, it just is because, and there's a lot of them around the country. So I wouldn't be, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be breaking ground or anything on it because there's a lot. Yeah, of but you've done a Super Bowl, so that yeah. gives you a little bit of a, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. just a smidge, right? You, 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 it gives well, you a little bit more cred okay. than most. Yeah, but there, but but there are camps, there are opportunities, or if you know if somebody's really locked in, wants to be, you know, a high level game official. Um, there are opportunities, there are camps out there, there are places where you can go and, and try to get, because there's, you know, there's college conference officiating supervisors that come to attend these all. And so it is really kind of, a, you know, a situation where you, there are, there are opportunities out there if you want to take them. It's just, there's not many people taking them because it's just like, yeah, I don't want to deal with it. Okay, I know it's chilly in here, but everybody watching it on YouTube. Rob's in short sleeves. I'm in short sleeves. <laughs> Cleet's got a fucking coat on. He's got a scarf. He's, he's, he's like dressed like he's a, he's a quarterback, he's right? A quarterback. <laughs> so, this is this is the podcast <laughs> version of, of having the sleeves on under the under the pad, <laughs> having the warming muff to put your hands yeah, on. That's right. Clean play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least I don't have my gloves so, on. Yeah. It is a little chilly down here. Do you think so? I, I mean, I'm not like going to go throw a coat on. See, the, the the bourbon warms you up faster than the beer or the wine. The bourbon, it, you know, goes straight to your head and makes you. When did you good. start the bourbon? Uh, right when you right when you arrived, yeah, because you were fashionably okay. half hour late for this. So I was like seven minutes. I walked up to your door at five oh seven. Yeah, but see. Your alignment quarterbacks are on time. They're they're the first one in the film. That room. is true. Coach is yelling at them <laughs> if they're not there. <laughs> Unless it's Tom Coughlin, then he's yelling at everybody. But that was that was five minutes early. Is on time. How many playoff games did you do this year? I worked a divisional round game with um, uh, the the Giants at Philly. Second round. Oh, that was a rough one. And Philly just got on them early and and took care of business. Philly's so, really good. That's why I knew I knew Super Bowl was going to be. So you've done one Super Bowl, yeah. and, and then after the Super Bowl, it was uh, it, you were like a, you were like a poster boy for for everybody because you, you were on Good Morning America and all that <laughs> stuff. You haven't done one since. How hard? Well, how hard is it get to the Super Bowl? Is there a lot of politics that goes on with that, or is it just how you grade? What and you're, you're looking at me like, don't ask this question, but I asked it anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, a, there's somewhat of a mystery component to it, but we are. I will say this: it is an evaluation process. Okay. Our regular season games are all. Literally every play of every game is evaluated for the grading system. My crew as a whole and then uh, individually at every position also. So I'm like every other position in our, on, our, on my crew, I'm, I'm competing against six other, 16 other officials for that one slot in the Super Bowl. So we have 17 crews total, so we have, we have 17 referees. So I'm one of them. So I'm, it's, it, you know, it, it's, and every year it starts over. We all start yeah. over. It's like, you know... It's like, you know, bring it back to the starting line and fire the gun, and here we, here we go. What, and you, you know, just you, you mentioned that. I mean, what kind of turnover is there at, at that level? I mean, is it, I mean, are you losing one guy every five years? Is it, no, is no, there no, a no, lot we're, of, we're is there kind of a lot of, yeah. In the past, I mean, last year was like, there was like 10. That this seems year, like, I mean, that seems like, oh man, that's a lot to replace. Yeah, well, there, our roster total is about 125. Okay. Okay. So we lose if we lose ten or twelve, that's you know that's ten percent of the roster turnover in one year, which is a lot. Is that this because year, of age, or is that because of grade performance? Um, mostly age, I'll say. You guys have you know they've got in and they've they've got twenty five years in or twenty years in and say it's enough. Um, and and uh, but there are some they do make some cuts relative to um, grading. You know if, if somebody has come in and they're in in year two, three, or four, they just aren't cutting it. Or in, in year 22, you know, they're just, you can tell that their skills have dropped. They're physically, they're not able to keep up and stuff like that. It's that they kind of like give a nudge. It's, it's time, you know, to, we'll give you one more year. Or it's time at the end of this season to move on, you know, and make it a what's, retirement. What's the hardest position uh, in officiating to, to be? Is the white hat just because you got to memorize everything? Or are there other, what? what? Can I clarify this? Yes. What's the hardest position physically? And what's the hardest That's fair. one mentally? Physically, they it used to be back in the day when we had our umpires situated between between the linebackers. Physically, that was hard because you're getting banged around. You know, you're trying to watch, you know, Rob Zadiska, the left tackle, you know, grabbing people, and all of a sudden you get, you know, 
picked off by a tight end that's crossing just because you just happen to be in his, in his way and not seeing him from peripheral. So those guys used to get banged around, knocked down quite a bit. So physically, that was always a hard one. Now they bounced, they bounced the referee over to the offensive side of the ball. So the umpire and I are relatively, we're 15 yards back, basically at the same yard line. So out of harm's way in many ways. Um, so which permits us to, to f- officiate better. Because you're not worried, he, you know, that back there, they were worried more about who's, who's coming. <laughs> not worried about getting snipered off. Yeah. Here comes Travis Kelsey, and he's going to drop yeah, me, right? Exactly right. So um, it, it does, it, it has helped us. So a lot of the positions, you know, like the deep guys will, they run more. The deep three, you know, field judge, back judge, and side judge, they, they, they run more just because they got deep balls and chasing, you know, punts and all that kind of stuff. But, but overall, it's pretty. It's, it's pretty comparative across the board, you know, physically. Um, mentally, it's just everybody has their own responsibilities in many ways. We have crews, you know, there's things we've got to do for the crew. There's things i got to do for me in my position, which is unique from the umpire in his position, which is unique from the back judge. So mentally, end of, end of the day, when, I, when we, hit this, we hit the locker room after the game, I'm mentally just fried. I'm, I'm just like, okay. Just well, because if you fuck up, there's... There's problems, right? I mean, you, well, yeah. you have to be perfect Plus, all the time. the level of concentration I got to have every play. Yeah. Because uh, nothing's scripted. That's what I'm saying. Nothing is scripted. You know, it's we, not like you can take a play off. No. Because, yeah, the second you do or the second you... you will take a play off. Yeah. <laughs> but, but there is, you know, every play I got to start back with the pre-snap the kind of routine that gets me locked in and ready for the snap to go. And boom. And then... You know, the play goes, it's set, we get the ball, and then we, we set it down. Now I, I work myself the same thing. Work back in the pre-snap routine, get ready, set for this next play. We average probably 175 or 180 plays per game. You know, so you're doing that 180 right. times and locking down because, like Rob says, if you don't, something's going to happen and you're going to be looking at the wrong guard when something goes, you know, goes, goes with us basically with the, when the left guard is doing something, hold clip, chops, whatever, you know, you're going to miss that if you don't do it. So mentally, and I say that I get, we literally get to the locker room and it's like, it's just like, okay, sit down. And it's been three hours, three plus of just, you know, chaos. That's what I always tell people. Are, What's the NFL game like? I'm like, it's three hours of chaos. It's just mad. It's fast. It's that furious. And it, it's just go, go, go. See, I, I would think the line judge would be the hardest one because uh, they got to get the brunt of the of the head coach, even if it wasn't their call. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's like it's like do they uh, ever yeah. go, coach? It wasn't my call. It's, I'm just not where I'm focusing. All right, yeah. that's that's what I don't miss that. That's a I, I in my career, I I was in the Big Twelve for a couple three years as a as a head linesman. So I'm there, and the coach if they're if they want to yell at somebody, they come right to that guy, and they're barking in the ear. So I don't. But and I'm now I'm in the middle of the field, and I can just kind of like. Can't hear you, coach. <laughs> I'll, I'll get to you. I'll get to you when I can. Kind of thing. But there it is. It's, it's just it's just a unique environment, right? Because I know, and I say, as you too, Rob, you would probably expect this, because I've played football through you know my childhood years and played at Division One football. Having that experience makes me a much better game official than I would be had I not had I had I. Been in any other sport or not done anything extra cricket at all? Is that a known thing for the coaches that you have to deal with? I mean, is are there officials who players, coaches are are going to look at and be like, okay, I'm not going to argue this with Clute. He played the game. He was a quarterback. He probably really knows. He's going to tell me to shut up. <laughs> it, is that a thing at that level for you? And I, I guess I ask that because as a, I can't really say. I ever thought that as a player. The officials were the officials. I didn't well, I didn't try to judge any of them differently, but I kind of wonder if you probably test to this, experience. frankly, because, and I don't know how much they did back in your day in the, in, the, in the league, in the NFL, when you were playing, but they, they, they know everything about us, okay? So I roll in there with a seven-man on-field crew with, and two replay guys. So there's nine of us that, that travel. And uh, they have a full scouting report on the officiating crew. Every team does. Every weekend we go somewhere, those two teams know who we are, know what our tendencies are, and and know how long, you know, our tenured guys. It's probably analytics on you guys, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I'm, and I, I'm not joking. Is they, they know who the, the, the veterans are. They know who the rookies are. They know literally 
anything from a tendency point that they can they can go through statistically, they know about us. And uh, I mean, so they know, and they got our backgrounds. They know I played football in Nebraska. I was a quarterback in ball. They just know the history and all this. So that's what they and do. I'm, and I, I got to be honest with you. I'm trying to remember if we ever reviewed that kind of information outside of maybe like the position coach saying, okay, okay. Line judge this week is Bob. Hug the ball. You can line up off sides. He ain't calling shit because he never does. Yeah. Other than that, it is is about really the only thing I ever remember. Now, maybe they're reading, not, they're getting that info off of us. Yeah, the, and of, then I talk about tendencies, so they'll know, well, this crew throws a lot of, of uh, interference, defensive pass interference. They're heavy on, or, or illegal contact. They, 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 they lead the league in, in calls for ICT or defensive holding, but whatever. So they track all that stuff. So like, oh, DBs, you just be careful. You got to be more careful this week to keep your hands back and away. But that's just all part of the game now, man. It's it's all that stuff statistically that they can take and use to try and gain a little bit of an edge. Man, every and they do. little thing for an edge. Yeah. I mean, there's analytics on everything, right? I mean, it, yeah. it does, I mean, you can find it. Do you pay attention to that analytics? And do you say, gosh, I, I what would you lead the league in? Was it defensive holding? Was it offensive holding? Was it pass interference? Did you lead the league in anything? You know, the interesting part is we we are not supplied that information really? by the league. Should no. you be or not? Uh See that's I, can, I can see why they wouldn't though. It would make sense because it would get in your brain and go, "Okay, I'm not going to call it because yeah, we're throwing an awful lot of of you know defense offsides, guys. They're, you know, yeah, just because yeah, he's lined you, up in the neutral zone. But let's give them a little bit of leeway. Maybe I don't know, but they just they there's I assume purposely they don't give us that information. Yeah, I would think that would so, be because part yeah. of me would sit there saying like, "Hey, if I'm an official, man, I want to be dead average in terms of calls." Yeah. Like, I don't want to be the guy calling nothing. I don't want to be the guy calling everything. You kind of want to be somewhere in the in the middle of that bell curve with that stuff. But it, as an official, I mean, you you just said it, Travis. If, if they tell you that, that's going to change how you're thinking, how you're looking, how you're viewing the, the game. The wine's right. kicking in. The coat's coming off. We're getting close. <laughs> We're unzipped, man. It's warming up. <laughs> okay, so what, what, what? let's go. <laughs> it, I didn't mean to cut you off, but let's go straight to the Super Bowl. Because they kept showing play after play where there's a similar hold, should we say, during the game that wasn't called. Then the hold is called late in the game for in favor of Kansas City. It was a hold, right? I mean, but but when do you call it? When do you not call it? Or is it that's, when you see it? You, that or you is don't the see magic it? magic question. Is is when see, t- when is it enough? Because it's a subjective. I mean, the objective component of it is where you can see the jersey. The, the hand and the jersey pull stretch, that's subjective. Okay, that's an objective trigger for me if I'm if I'm on the field looking at that. I can see. Okay, he's got him. He's got him. Now, is it long enough? Does he release him just at the point in time? I'm like, let him go, let him go. Boom, he pops. He lets him go. Okay, and we let it, you know <clears throat> pass on it. No foul. Or you, as he's watching, is he got? He's got it. Jersey pull. Let him go. Let him go. He he holds on a click or two too long. Now here comes the flag. Okay, so that's a subjective component that triggers that judge, that, that in this case, the field judge, to make a decision subjectively when's enough a, is enough, okay? When it, so in this case, to say, yeah, he didn't throw it earlier in the game, but now he threw it in, well, there's a lot of different factors that come into play. But, but so, theor- theoretically, if the official sees it and it falls into that, yeah, that was a hold. Even I mean, with, within the realm of that subjectivity, even you're looking at going, yeah, that was a hold. When it occurs, that shouldn't affect the call, correct? What you mean as in time in the game? Yeah. First quarter, second quarter? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things. I mean, if now if if it's one of those things where you kind of decided, I'm not sure decided is the right word, but let's say if you saw the exact same hole hold in quotations here. Yeah. If you saw that exact same hold earlier in the game, first quarter and second quarter and third quarter, and we're not calling it then, I would assume you wouldn't call it in the fourth quarter either. However, let's say you saw it and it clicked in your head. Yeah, that was definitely a hold. You're calling it if, if I mean, if it's, 80 seconds left in a tight game, I would imagine you're still calling that, correct? 
You'd like, for consistency standpoint, you'd like to yeah. say, yeah. The answer, yes. I mean, here's the problem. You know, Television has eight gazillion cameras at every angle. Right. You're still blocked by, sometimes you're not going to see it, right? right. And, and, and if you're focused on one assignment, which you are, right? And everybody else is focused on one assignment, it doesn't, you can still, the magic of angles and, and geometry play a huge, huge part. And even just timing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, when you slow something down to a millionth of a second, <laughs> yeah. it's easy to go, look at that hole right there. Sure is. We yeah. sitting at home are experts <laughs> <laughs> due to the magic of technology. It, and that it is. And that's the that's perspective that Joe Blow Public doesn't really understand from, from watching it at home and seeing how do they, how do they ever miss that. Well, like you say, I'm, I'm at one angle and I get a split second to say, is that enough? Is it enough? Is it enough? Yeah, I'm going to throw it. Or no, it's not enough. Let it go. And so, you know, those things come into play. And then, and then the difference between the first quarter, maybe, maybe it's, the same, it's the same play that happened in, this, in the fourth quarter with the Chiefs, but it's actually in the first quarter. But the ball's being thrown to the opposite side of the field. Okay, now, now there's still the grab. There's still the hold, but the ball's going the other way. Okay, then we're like, no, we just lay off those, right? And that's where they might be comparison of a little bit of apple-orange component to that because the ball is either out other direction or it's out to a different receiver or the quarterback's been sacked at the time when the, really the hold takes place. So then all those factors come into play. But this one here, you know, it was, it was late in the game, the fourth quarter. There was a hold. The ball was thrown to this, this receiver who was being held. There you go. It just kind of triggered it. So, um you know, you can argue it all day long, but I, I, I think it was a it was a gutsy call and a good call. Well, and, and I mean, I think most fans, if you talk to most fans, they'll say, "Hey, yeah, it was a, it, it was the right call." I think people were fired up emotionally at the time. Well, when yeah, the Super Bowl is on the line, yeah. Yeah. it's going to fire you oh, up. Yeah. Right? I mean, I think most people <laughs> who are even remotely halfway reasonable looking at it. Plus, when the defensive back is basically saying, yeah, I, I held him and hoped I didn't draw the flag. That was refreshing, I have to yeah. say, as an official, to have a player in that, in, in that environment, that, the, the, as big a call as that was in that point in time in, so what, in a Super Bowl, to say, yeah, I, I, so I, was, it, I held So him. what Cleet's saying is that guy's never getting called for pass <laughs> interference again. <laughs> Yeah, he's our, our referee association man of the year right now. He's got my vote. <laughs> but it's like you, Rob. If I call a, a holding on you, you, you never. I, rarely do I get a right tackle, left guard, left tackle come up and say, "Yeah, you're right. I was holding him." You know, it's always like, "No, oh, I mean, you, you got to you See, call I, now." Love. You know, I would always, I, and I don't know. Maybe I was a little bit more analytical about this kind of stuff. But I would, I remember any time I got a call. And it's not like I held, well, let me rephrase. I'm, I'm an offensive lineman. <laughs> yes, we held on every play. And if we weren't, even at the NFL, I remember our NFL, one of my NFL line coaches telling me, he said, if you are not holding, you're not playing correctly at this level. Anyway, <laughs> moving on from that, um, I always, if I ever, I, I can't say, I, I really didn't have a, I was not a penalty prone guy. Some guys are. Some guys jump off sides a ton. If I had anything, it was maybe that. I remember first NFL play ever. We were playing the Cleveland Browns. This was the old Browns. That's how old I am. This was the original Browns before they moved to and Baltimore and became the Ravens. First game, first play. I heard a sound, thought it was the quarterback's cadence. I flinched legal motion full okay. start oh my god first, first play of your career first play of my career <laughs> Pre -season. Status quo. what are you fucking Pre -season thinking game and then i think i did it again <laughs> now, i'm trying to remember the story would be better if it was the very next play and i kind of think it was it was the very next play i jumped again so we're back 10 yards already <laughs> um and it's all on me anyway I, I, I got my shit together and down <laughs> after that and did fine. But I just remember going to the old going to the going to the line and the guy laughing at the, the old line coach laughing at me. I didn't have a lot of holding calls, but holds no. are the thing that's are always subjective for an offensive lineman. Holds and then chop blocks. Yeah. It's one of those that wasn't a chop block. What were you looking at? But if it was a hold 
man, I always made it a point to go to the official and just ask him, hey, what was it you saw? I wouldn't yeah. argue the call. I mean, shit, if you saw a hold, you saw a hold. I'm not going to argue it with you. What did you see? Because my thought process was, if you'll tell me what you saw, okay, well, I'm going to change my holding technique <laughs> to prevent that yeah, from yeah. happening he, he, again. He brings up a good point. Are, are, are players like that today, or do they bitch more? No, they. I would say players are more like that today. The ones I'm dealing with. Now, here, I'll give you my responsibility uh, on every snap. I, I usually have, I'm looking, quarterback's number, my number one, okay? So anytime the quarterback's under pressure, I'm, I focus on quarterback. They just want to protect the quarterback that way. But primarily, I'm, I'm looking at right, right guard, right tackle, and potentially if there's a tight end in there. Those are the three blocks. I'm, I'm, the snap goes, those are the three blocks I'm focused on. So I'm like, I tell people, hey, I deal a lot with linemen. And uh, I usually, you know, early in the game, we'll go in the huddle and just talk to the linemen and say something like, hey, hands in all day long. If you get them out here, bring them back in, we'll be fine all day long. I don't want to throw a flag. We'll just keep playing. I said, and you know, because I know it's like, it's warfare. These guys up front. I mean, it's one on one. I got you. You got me. We got basically. You figured, let's just say, sixty or seventy offensive plays in the game. We're going seventy. We're going man to man seventy times. You and I today. I'm trying to beat you. You're trying to beat me. So I'm like, dude, it's a battle. So I, I see that, and I just see the fight that these guys have. So I respect, hugely respect the offensive line because I've got to see them and be primarily responsible for them over the years. And so I, I'm given, you know, a lot of, I don't want to say leeway to it, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, I want to work with these guys. And they ask me questions, I'll ask them questions, but I certainly answer those questions like all the time. But I'll get those. If you ask me, are they, are they still doing that? Yeah. I mean, that's I'll refreshing. Because that. Yeah. Hey, that was a huge learning thing for me. Because I even remember at Nebraska, Getting called. I, I mean, I got called for a hold. I couldn't. I mean, early on in my career, redshirt freshman, maybe. And I remember, I, I think it was actually more th that initial, dude, what the heck, <laughs> kind of reaction on my part. Yeah. And I remember the official turning around and looking at me, and he very specifically did the whole, like, hey, here's what you were doing. Here's what the guy did. We're going to call that every day of the week and twice on Sunday, if you were doing such and such instead, we'll never call that. And that was kind of the little switch that got flipped in my head. And all of a sudden it was like, oh. Well, being the men's these that guys, you are. Well, I was just, <laughs> well, I just, I just kind of figured all of a sudden <laughs> really? in, my, in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, these guys, these guys are a learning source. I mean, this, this is something I can learn from. It's, it's one of those, I can use this information now to beat the guy across from me better. If I know what the criteria is, yeah. you do everything within yeah. that criteria. That's right, because it might be, okay, you're inside, inside, now that right hand gets outside. Yeah. Now, you're kinda, now you're starting to hook the guy because you got running back coming around you this way. And I'm like, I'm always like, your right, hand, your right arm's out there. If you get it out there, you, you, you try to work it back inside here, I'm going to let you go. But you keep it out there, you hook him, Running back goes off your ass, it's a hold all day long, right? So it's, those are the kind of things that I will talk to my linemen about during a game. What to, to, You mentioned uh, Joe, Bo, Joe Blow public. Uh, it, what's the most misunderstood rule in, in the National Football League? Because to me, and it drives me nuts that it's been explained, is still the completion of a catch. Like, I, mean, uh, yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, there are times where it's a catch – but the tip of the ball hits the ground and it's like incomplete. I'm like, well, he still had possession of it. It's not like he didn't control the football, but it's a, if any part of that ball hits the ground, it's like incomplete pass. And so what's the most, in your mind, the most misunderstood rule? I think you nailed it right there. I think catch is still a work in progress as far as what's a catch, what's a no catch. And so, and how they're going to tweak it, I don't know. If they're going to just kind of continue on with where we're at right now is they might. But, you know, the competition committee gets together, you know, in the spring every, every year after the season's done. So they're kind of queuing it up to do this now. I don't know if that's going to be a key point for them or not this year to kind of revisit it. Because it's, there's been so many different uh, movements made with catch, no catch, you know. How, they, how they, much they, of the, I call it the real time aspect of it. 
because you look at the the instant replay it's amazingly easy to break down this stuff it, when you're looking at it frame by frame with with digital cameras and the, the technology that we've got now um yeah it, at some point i recall hearing somebody saying when you're looking at instant replay, you've got to interpret how it appears in real time as well. Does that play into these decisions? I mean, because yes. there's there's plays where maybe if you slow it down enough, there's maybe two frames on these incredibly high-tech, high-speed cameras. Well, there's maybe two frames where the ball technically is outside the guy's possession. But if you watch it in real time, you're sitting there going, oh, yeah, totally a catch. He never lost possession of that. Right. The answer, yeah, there's a real-time component that does come into play while we're, when we're looking at it. So, so you, like you said, you can slow it down. What, what, what happens is in real time, you know, there might be a, a picture of the guy where he's got the ball clearly in his hands, both feet are down, and, you know, the next tick or two, he starts to move a little bit. Well, that all might happen in a split second where the ball is just getting in. Now he just got it, and now he just starts to move, and it's out. And so it's a very similar play in the Super Bowl. If you remember, there was a, there was a, it was kind of a swing pass out to yeah. uh, a, a Philadelphia player. And boom, it just came in, and, and he gets blown up right about the same time. And they end up making it. They ruled it a, a fumble on the field. KC picked it up and went back. And they brought it back. Said no, he didn't. It wasn't a catch. It wasn't. He didn't complete the catch. And there is that element of time that you talk about. That. So we all we need we need hand we need basically clear possession. Locked. You know he, he locked the catch. Good. So we had it. Both feet were down. But then there was that third component of time or to make a football move, meaning time to turn up field and go, or time to take a third step and go, or something. Um, that, as you say, is there a number there. of steps involved? They take two steps; it's a completion, or yeah. It's see, it's it's always is even there, that's is there a little a third, subjective. There's a third, is there a third step involved? That's one of the things we're looking for. Does he turn and and start to head up field? Does he make a you know a move that um, is in, that uh, all that triggers in that element of time? So this one where it was just boom, boom, balls out. Now um, we make that incomplete all day long. But again. There is objective components that combine with subjective components that make it just hard at the end of the day. Because like I said, it's, it's, every play is unique in many ways. So one catch could look identical to, identical to another catch you had earlier in the game, but they're two different results. Because the ball, when it hit the ground, you know, he dives for it, he's got it in his hands, but when it hits the ground, the ball moves in his hands. He loses possession of it. Now, if, he, if, if that would happen where he, he'd have it, the ball hits the ground, but he doesn't lose any possession of it. Now we got a catch. But if the ball squirts out, you know, spins out of his hands, and you can see him losing possession of it. He may regain it before, you know, he rolls on the shoulder and rolls over. But if the ground triggers that loss of possession, then it's a no, it's a no catch. So, so on an instant that's replay. what I'm saying. It's hard <laughs> to see that in, in an instantaneous yeah. moment when it's boom, boom, is, is just really hard. And that's why I love the fact that we have a replay. I love where replay is at now. It just is because we want to get it right. Yeah. You know, we don't want to walk off the field and have, you know, the world talking about the officiating in one play in the third quarter that cost the team, you know, the game itself. We don't know. We want to get them correct. And if that's what replay does for us, then I'm all for it. So do you, do you ever get go to the replay monitor and you know you're going to have to reverse something You say you're on somebody's home turf? Do you just close your eyes and go, shit, I don't want to make this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I've been there before. I, I have. It's funny you say that because they're like, I'm like, okay, so we're reversing this. Yeah, okay, no touchdown, right? Yep, okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. So here's a then question like, for you. Going, going to replay, I'm not saying, I'm not asking you to weigh in on whether we should or should not have instant replay. What's the best thing about instant replay? What's the worst thing? Ooh, good question. Well, it's a good, very good question. The best thing about it is, is it permits us to to correct. Um, I would call them egregious errors, big errors. You know, a touchdown that we don't call a touchdown, we make it a touchdown because because it, it is right. It lets us correct that. The the component of what's the worst thing about replay is sometimes 
there is a, a component that people think that replay can get everything correct. When in fact, there's, there's just a, com, a situational stuff that happens in a particular play where replay may not have the angle, even if there's... It's know, still unclear even after replay. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, the public thinks every play has, has to be corrected, needs to be corrected. And sometimes, you know, we're dealing with coaches, with, you know, the coaches' challenges and all that component of everything, too, where, um, you know, they've only got a certain amount of challenges that they can throw. And if they burn one early in the game, now they're at risk of... It's just a lot going on with, with replay. But I'm, I am 100% in favor of replay. Don't get me wrong here. And where it's come from and where we're going to is, is um, a, a dramatic change in from you know, along the road that we've, we've, we've traveled with it, but, uh, it'll get better. It'll get better as time goes on. I think each year it, we seem to do a little bit more to make the game play better on TV because now instead of sometimes when it's clear that a ball bounced before the receiver went low to try to catch it and we call it a, a you know, a catch on the field and it's clear to, to replay above that it bounced beforehand. Uh, instead of going to the box, you know, instead of stopping the game that this plays under review, going to the box, having me put the headset on and do our thing, we're getting cued in from replay. Cleat, that ball hit the ground. It, it bounced in. It's an incomplete pass. Okay. So I'm like, we just say, bring it in. I just click it and say, after di additional discussion, the ball hit the ground. It's an incomplete pass. It's third down. So there going. is that communication happening. So the, the replay guys are watching all of this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's for the clear and obvious ones. Okay, okay, he's yeah. not going to say, "Oh man, is that is that?" It's just, it, it's it's for the ball bouncing and hitting the ground, and then and it comes into the player's hands. Then it's for those types of things, or when the knee is completely, clearly down, and now and he's locked in, and now somebody comes and punches it out. We've got the knee down in possession. He's down by contact. It's not a fumble. So that's where we're getting. I'm getting in my ear, cleat that. The knee was down. It's he was down by contact at the four yard line. And, and okay. I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to a ask it just for clarification. You're the only one. The white hat is the only one who can hear that from the booth, right? You, nobody else on the field has that. No, everybody. We're, everybody really? can hear that from upstairs now. Yeah, I would think that would be confusing. I, but that's just me. But I guess maybe maybe from the standpoint of who's talking to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but are they only talking to you as, as the referee? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So my guys know that if we're hearing from upstairs, they're pretty much talking to me okay 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 but they may be able to so to exclude them because we had a, a few years when it was just it was just that direct line communication like you're talking yeah. about and my other guys are going hey what's going on what are you talking about? okay I'm like just hold on i'll get back to you i'm waiting, <laughs> waiting you know so they basically open the line and so everybody all seven all nine of us are basically clued in together plus we have new york on the line also so we can they're in the command center back in new york and i can get a I can get in my ear, my boss sitting in New York City in front of a monitor. He can, he can hit a button and talk to me directly. They're, they're watching from all San Francisco. Of oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So huh. you, you've got, I mean, you've kind of got the eye in the sky from different people, different locations. We do. Yeah. And it's a huge, it's a great benefit to the game because me, I, I, just, I like just to keep the game rolling, you know? I like, I like it for it to be a good show. And so manage the game, get the big ones that we need to get when the safety fouls, get all those. Let's just keep this thing rolling. And if we can expedite a, a ball that bounces in and we've got it as a completed catch for 13 yards and a first down, if we can expedite that ball bounced and, uh, and bringing it back for third down in 30 seconds, 30 seconds versus three minutes going over to the box and putting the headset on and doing all that, I'm all for it. And that's where that's where we've come, and it's been great. I, I think I know what the answer is going to be after you say that. Um, so one of and, and it actually, you know, I'll even say this is going back to Kelly Saulfield, who, former Nebraska center, former New York Giant. Um, before replay came into college football, this is pre-replay era. But I remember it was right before they were going to institute. So everybody knew it was coming. They knew it was going to get instituted. It was maybe the year before. And I had a conversation with Kelly about this. And he made the point that he said his biggest worry. Now, this was, like I said, this is pre-replay. So we haven't actually done anything with it yet. He said his biggest worry 
was that it was going to cause an erosion of the skills of the officials. It, kind of in the sense of you, you'd maybe lose just a minuscule amount of attentiveness because you're sitting there going, well, if I got it wrong, I can always go back and check the replay. Your thoughts on that? Do you, do you think there's, I mean, is that real? Is it not real? Did he have a point? Did that end up not playing out? Because like I said, I, I actually have not asked Kelly that question. Sin, I mean, Kelly officiated in the Big 12 for another 10 or 15 years after I had that conversation with him. So it, it's not like he made that comment <laughs> right. with the experience of instant replay. He merely stated beforehand this was what he was worried about. And I would say, I'd say no, definitely. And the, you talk about the erosion of skills, no. It's not a thing is. Um, it is because, some, like I said earlier, I mean, the game is too fast. Again, things happen at different angles. Somebody sees... I see one thing at one angle. You see another thing at, a, at the same thing at a different angle. We may have two two different interpretations. Okay, so to say, well, I'm just relying upon replay, and I'm just like, ah, whatever, whatever happens. No, that's really not the way we are wired as officials, right? I want to get every, I want to get everything that I call correct, right? And I want to be locked in on everything, so I'm not thinking about something else, and I miss something. Um, so replay is there to, you know, it was brought in there to assist, to kind of correct really, really egregious errors and uh, to aid us. Because the last thing I want is is we give a, a touchdown after that, you know, play at midfield where the ball bounced in and we gave it to them and they continued the drive and they go on and score the winning touchdown and game's over. And we don't know until we get to the locker room that five plays earlier, there was a, a bounced ball that we gave a completed catch to and that led to the game being determined one way or the other, that's the worst thing for us as officials, right? Yeah. To go, shit, are you kidding me? I wish I would have seen, somebody would have seen that. Did anybody see that? No, <laughs> all, I didn't see it, you know, those kind of things. And that's where I'm like, that's why the advent of, of replay, for me, I'm like all for it, 100%. And to where we've come from is, 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 is a dramatic gap of where we started from. And, it, and it's, for us, it's great. Because now I can have, like I said, just talked about that instantaneous feedback from my either my replay guy upstairs or New York saying, ball bounced, it's third down, incomplete pass. Do you guys see, or how often, if at all, is there a call that gets missed and you, nobody catches it till afterwards? Does, does That's that a, reviewable, you mean? Or not even a, re, well, reviewable or not. I mean, I suppose if it's reviewable, it's getting reviewed. I, I mean, it, is that a thing where a call gets made? It's probably the incorrect call. Nobody really realizes it till after the game. Is it does is does that happen yeah, at all? Yeah, when the grades come out on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> well, you talk about you talk. That, well, you know, I guess I, it's I, can I talk why, about those yeah. kind of calls that we can get assistance on? If I call a if I call a hold on my right tackle on a sweep play going right, they're not going to come in and say, "Cleet, pick that flag up." It's not a hold. No, that's not what that's not what replay is designed for. Okay, because in my mind, I'm not throwing that flag unless to me it's clear that there is a restriction and it basically freed that running back. Right. So the only way they're the only things they're changing for us is the ball hit the ground before he, he brought it in. Okay? So let me, stuff like that. That's give, black and white. Give me an example, I guess. So my question would be: Give me an example. What would get your grade docked? Like, what would you? Okay, yeah, you. You got downgraded on this. What would this be for? Give me a for instance. Same example. I call you for a for a hold on a sweep play coming around your end. I call you basically for for a restriction. Like we we deem it met a material restriction at the point of attack, and running back gets freed. He goes for five yards. He goes for fifty yards. Whatever it is, I call you for a hold, and we go through enforce the penalty, continue on the game. They look at it later in the office and say, yeah, you called it, but it's just not enough restriction, okay? The guy had him. He was a little bit outside, but we, but he was, his hand was inside enough, and, uh, and we don't want to call it. Or by the time of the, the big hook and pull, running back was already five yards outside that, that block, so we want to stay away from that because it had nothing to do with the running back and the position that he was in, what, he, what happened after. So those are the types of things that, that from my position I get. Or – 
I call roughing the passer. They say now nah, the, the the contact was high enough. It was more in the thigh area, not in the knee area. You know, which is which is a difference of about four inches when a guy's coming full speed out of your quarterback and everything else. So those are the types of things where they'll look and and again the grading system is there to teach and to help us tweak. You know our what we're looking at, what we're doing, and what we're calling. It's the equivalent of me asking the official back in 1991, hey, what did you see? Yeah. It's that kind of thing. Okay. And you know, ultimately, then our bosses make the decision, was it enough? Okay. Yeah, he saw that the hand was outside, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a hold that we want called every play, right? Unless it, again, unless it, it triggers that material restriction that lets the running back get outside. Now he's got the corner. Now he's going for five. Now he's going for 50, whatever it is. Right. So you mentioned your crew. Is there any two part question here? Is there ever disagreement uh, with your crew over certain calls or whoever throws the flag is always right? And how long have you had your crew with you? And what, what does chemistry mean? Because it's, 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 it's a team, right? So I, I think that would, there's, there's a lot going on with your own crew because conflict is good at times with, with healthy teams. Is there ever conflict, but how about just the friendships and, and, and the crew that, that works together? So every year they will, they will tweak the crews really? to some degree. Yeah. So we have, I think we have six retirees leaving after this last season. So we're going to have six rookies come in. And, um, and every year they try to balance the 17 crews out as, as, as evenly as possible. Because you don't want to load one crew up with too many, you know, Ex- young officials, including rookies, and they might struggle just because of the way, you know, the way of the NFL goes. But, and then vice versa, you might have too many veterans on one crew to where, you know, they're, they're just crushing it because they're, they're just, they have that experience, they know the game, and they control the game and everything else. So they try to balance. So every year, my crew gets tweaked a bit. Now, there are seven of us on the field, they're not going to change, you know, five or six positions. It's going to be more like one or two. Um, and so that's kind of what they do every season. And so, but once my crew comes out, is, is given to me, say, in June, mid-June, then um, July really kicks off our year. Um, and we start going to, mini, to training camps in July. And then um, August, it's training camps. And, and we're working preseason games together. This last August, for instance, I was home nine days in August. Otherwise, I was in training camps and working preseason games. In August, my month of our month of August is historically the biggest, busiest month for officials because we're just out training, okay, as a crew. So all seven of my, my guys will go to like last year. <clears throat> we went to Miami and we were we ended up being there for a week because we were doing combined camp with my with the Dolphins and the Eagles, and so we're just out at practice, just getting you know seeing plays, just starting to get your 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 eyes focused again and your brain functioning again on movement. And here and there, and um, so we spend that time together. It's really great. And then we worked, we ended up we're staying all week long, and then we worked the Saturday night preseason game between Philadelphia and, and Miami, and then we went home. And then we, uh, the next day we went off, or two days, I'm home two days, and I jump off to Minnesota for four days We're with my guys. We go to training camp in Minnesota. So there's a lot of preseason stuff. You talk about how do you kind of come together, and that's really the time for us is is – is July and August, and then of course we kick off in September. So, are, are you watching tape now, though? Do you, I mean, do you just sit? You know, I know you're done, uh, but do you go? You know what? I'm going to pop in a game and just watch. Do you? Do you now? Do, yeah. Um, I like to give myself a kind of a clean break for a month or so. Just yeah, um, but I still, you know, I, I say that, but at the same time, I I kind of keep my football buddies who I consider, you know, some of my closest friends. But we just call and, you know, just catch up and chat, you know, just BS and stuff about everything. So, um, but I do like to take a break from it because it's, it's, it is pretty consuming as the season starts and once we get into it. And then it becomes a physically a grind because it's every, you know, every Saturday morning I'm on a 6 a.m. flight out of Omaha going north, south, east, or west. And then I'm home sometimes, you know, that's Sunday night or it's the following Monday because I can't get back from the west coast or whatever it is. And it's week after week after week after week, so it, it becomes a it becomes a physical grind, and it's, and you know mentally too. So I just kind of like take a little mental break here. Do you watch college time. football? Very little of it. Is that hard? Knowing a, a being one a one time <laughs> college quarterback, also an official in, in college football, is it hard? 
go, God, I, I don't watch as much as I want to. Is it because you don't want to anymore? Or is it just because no, it's you don't not have because time? because I, wa- I don't want to. It's because I, I, in my mind, I can't justify watching a college football game when there's game film I should be watching. On sa- like on a Saturday. Okay. okay. So we fly in and we'll have meetings on Saturday afternoons. And so, you know, for probably, you know, roughly three hours is what we meet. And so I'm, I'm during the week, I'm kind of slowly getting the, the meeting preparation materials done, including the film work on it. So I'm breaking down the Giants and I'm breaking down the Vikings for our game this weekend. So I'm pulling plays from their, their previous games to show my guys on Saturday afternoon. Plus I'm breaking down the film, our film from last week. What, what we can take away from our game last week from a teaching standpoint, I call them like literally just teaching points from the last game, whether it's a, how a play was called or how we, how we worked it. Just stuff that, you know, so I usually show 10 or 12 plays from the week before and just talk about stuff. Sometimes it's, it's great positioning, great call, this is what we want. And then it's other times it's like, you left the goal line too early on this one. And let's just think about that because at this point, the goal line is the most important spot on the field for you. Do you make sure to show a play where, to criticize yourself in front of your crew? How do you know that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, honestly, I do. Because I'm, I'm like, hey, I'm, if I'm going to criticize anybody, and I don't really, I don't criticize to criticize. Yeah. I, I think I call it kind of teach. teach. Yeah. So if I'm teaching them, I, I kind of like to use myself as a teaching point to say, yeah, I, uh, you know, I, sh- I, I was looking left guard here when I should have been on, on tight end. Because that's where the point of attack was. That's where the critical block was. Not the left guard. He's buried inside with the center on a double team. But for some reason, I, there was something that he did that locked me in on it. When I'm looking here, I should be here. Definitely okay? wasn't so, a hold. Yeah. <laughs> but those, so, yeah, Trav, I, I don't exclude myself from that at all. You know, during your, but during your off week, don't you usually go to a Husker game? Don't you try to get down there? I, I've seen you down there before. Yeah. If, if there is a, if I have an off week, which we have during the season of the 18 weeks, regular season, we have two of them off. It just so happens if there was like this year, Wisconsin was playing in Nebraska when we had the weekend off. So, uh, yeah, I took my son and we went down and, and actually the whole family came down, I guess we did. But yes. So I still enjoy, you know, going to the game and doing all that. Um, but on the weekends, I won't sit in my room Saturday night no. and watch, you know. Cal and you, Stanford? Yeah. I, I just don't because <laughs> there's too many things I'm thinking yeah. about myself for the next day that, that uh, I need to not overload my brain, so to well, speak. Well, you mentioned decompressing. You went to, you went to Springsteen uh, Saturday night in Kansas City. How, you took your kids to the very first show. Yeah. You're the most badass dad <laughs> around. He took the kids to Springsteen. Okay, well, hold on. How old are your kids? Um, Hudson's nine and Maeve's 11. All right. Solid. And they both, I'm telling you, Did they, like they it? loved it. Awesome. Yeah. They're both, they're like, you know, when they're saying, can we get t-shirts, dad? I'm like, yeah, yeah. that's, that's, Life that's the trigger awesome, that says, though. yeah, they loved it. So, um, but it was, it was great. Spectacular show. And at 73 years old, the guy is just, he's, a, he's amazing. And to do what he's doing physically is, is yeah, that's not easy to do. Life but his voice and his voice is right. awesome. Is it voices, really? Yeah, I'm telling you, would not lie. The guy, the guy, just spectacular. Show. Is, is music your thing? Is traveling? Because what do you do to decompress? Because I mean, you, 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 I mean, you're a lawyer by by trade. Yeah, uh, you, you don't sponsor our podcast, however, or in Oregon do, and uh, you know, really? yeah, you know, you know, Connor, they're in uh, your state. They're, they're right by you. You're over there on uh, like by 120, 114th of Dodge, right? Used to be. Oh, you I'm moved. downtown now. Oh, you are. Yeah, I'm at 20th and Douglas. Okay, so Oren Horrigan, uh, Connor Orr, he's a he's a he's a sports agent, NIL um, lawyer, uh, does some other things, but uh, proud supporter of the, of the podcast. So I got I got to get Connor's name in there. He's gonna. Yes, I, I didn't know there were sponsorship opportunities here. So well, now now you know there is. <laughs> we're we're, <laughs> there, we're there are. Kind of <laughs> No, we're whores. We take money is what we do. <laughs> All right, uh, but but you know what else do you do? I mean, I, besides being the, the the lawyer, and then uh, but is it music? Is it is it traveling? Is it you know going to the gun range? What is it? Uh, not definitely not a gun range. Oh, that, that's right. him. Is he's that you? Guy. He's got to go <laughs> shoot ARs all day long. Huh? Um, Don't get him started. I, I tell you, it's it's kind of you know I I commit as much time to the practice of law. I don't I don't. I'm 
because the season is what it is, it's six months long. So I'm six months where I'm got, I just tell people I got two full-time jobs six months out of the year. You've only got so much time to. Right. The job becomes a little bit of the hobby. And then you said you've got an eight and a nine year old. Yeah. And so you tell yeah, whatever they, it. whatever say, they are doing. Well, we were talking state wrestling earlier. I mean, that's my hobby is whatever sport my kids are doing, whatever their school. I mean, but, activity. Yeah. so we're all right around the same age. Cleet's the oldest one in this room. Uh, I'm the second oldest. <laughs> and Rob, Rob's the youngest one. <laughs> we but, all got but, a killer. But I think we're all very that. similar in, in that we, uh, I, I mean, Rob, you, you were at the med center and you knew the hours were going to be incredible. So you went to the orthopedic hospital where it was more, it was more structured. It was you know a little more, yeah, I don't want to call it a nine to five, but it, it's mostly, you know, and you guys day. remember when I was on channel three and I was doing Todd and Tyler, my daughter got, my oldest daughter got to high school and I said, I'm going to miss everything of my kids if I don't yeah. stop because I was doing Creighton basketball, all that stuff. It, as the, your kid's age, is it getting harder to go? Because, you know, I've been seeing you at Marion games. I mean, the weekends will, will go into that stuff as they get uh, as they get old. Yeah, it is, but you're right. I'm, I, I, I say I'm just kind of following along with you, your guys' leads. It's the same thing. Is is, is you got to prioritize. Yeah. And uh, I prioritize family. And, um, you know, my commitment to both, both my jobs, it's just the way it is. So, so does my golf suffer a little bit? Yeah. I don't, I don't play as many rounds as my buddies do, which I'd like to, but I don't, um, does other things, you know, does other things suffer? I don't, I don't, and I use the term suffer, but I shouldn't because I don't, I don't feel that I'm suffering anyway. Yeah, you don't. Dude, I'm not, I love, like I said, I love the practice of law. I really do. Um, and I love the, you know, the NFL and the opportunities I get there. I, I really do. And it's just, and then with, with my wife and kids, you know, it's just, it's just another part of what everything that that's what my world re revolves around are really those three things. And as much as I can reach out to do other things at other times, I will, but always with the understanding that at some point I can't cut myself too thin or else I, I probably damage what I'm doing in some way um, that makes or sense. limit what I'm doing in some ways because with my football, with my lawyering and even with, with family, you know, if it just it is what it is. So it's a, it's a delicate balance. Um, but it's, I've been doing it a long time now. Like I said, I've been doing 35 years of really both lawyering and officiating. And so I've kind of got it down to where I know the expectations of myself and my jobs and what's required. And, and I just kind of do it. And your wife's always right. Remember that. The wife oh, yeah, is always yeah, yeah. right. Okay. And that's what people say. How do you do it? And I say, you know what? Don't ask me because I don't. I just do it. Yeah. You know, I, I go to bed at night thinking, what am I going to do tomorrow? You know, and, um, and I just do it. So here's a little bit of a backtrack question. This is kind of the, we're, I, I feel like we're getting into the, what are the fun questions here? So I got to ask. You Best shit talker in the NFL. Now let's. I'm going to back <laughs> off of the current job because I don't want to get. You can ask that one. I don't want to get Clay in trouble. Okay, let's go back to the Big Twelve days. Worst coach, whether it's a head coach or an assistant coach, who was the worst coach in the Big Twelve that you had to deal with? Like one of those where you would roll in game day and you're just like, oh, I hope so and so just keeps his mouth shut. <laughs> but they now we're going they back. Can't, they Gosh, can't fire going... you for this. Yeah. Um, Unless he's an assistant I, to the National Football League now, <laughs> you know there. Yeah, yeah, right. There are always, you know, there's always those coaches that you, th they, you know, that are just you know, like, oh man, I got to deal with this guy. But at the same point in time, I mean, you know the game, I know the game, I know the pressures involved with with co as a coach. So I, and having played it again, this is where I get back to playing, having played for as long as I played at what level I played at, it gives me a better understanding, I think, of, of what the dynamics, all, all the dynamics of game day are, which means there's a whole lot of pressure on that coach and his staff and everybody else to win, right? So I'm not, I'm not the one that's going to jump down a coach's butt, ass, however you want to say it. I can say ass on this. Yeah, you but, can uh, say whatever you want. Jump down a coach's ass because he's, he's yelling, because he's – you know, he's so worked up about a particular Well, and I'm not I'm even the one that's going to kind of listen and say, yeah, 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 I hear you, coach. We'll do better or we'll get it or I'll get back to you. Were later. there coaches that were harder to work with than others? Sure. Sure. Um, 
Stoops, Oklahoma, he was, you know, he was, he was a hard guy to work for, but, you know, not that we couldn't work for him. He just, he, there's, he just liked to, you know, he's demanding. And uh, Mac Brown was, was not bad. At times, Mac would, as I remember, he would just kind of shoot, go off, you know, but he would he'd kind of come back down. Um, I can't say there's anybody, one guy that I just said stand out and say, that's the guy, right? Because they all have, you know, different games brings out different emotions in different coaches. So you might have a guy that I'm thinking coming in going, man, this is going to be a hard day, fellas, because this guy. And at the end of the day, we walk out and not a word, not a peep, nothing, right? And it's just, it's just, you just don't know. It's just really the game of football is that way. That's why I tell people, it's not, you know, we're not scripted. This isn't a movie. It's a TV show, yeah, but it's not a movie where you can, all right, cut, break. We're going you know, to take two on this one. Back it up and start over. No, because you can't, you know, football just isn't that way. It's live TV, man, and there's no second shots, right? So were, that, were there, I understand the, the pressures going on in the game. Were, were there coaches that you were, oh, my God, thank God we're doing this game this week? And, again, I'm talking back in the Big 12 days. Were there coaches that were just outstanding to work with? And I'm not saying you got to say Osborne. I, I actually <laughs> always thought Osborne would be kind of a, kind of a tough guy to have to fish. Did you ever have time? Yeah. Um, no, no, because he retired '97. You didn't go to the Big Twelve yeah, until right, 2000, right. so you never yeah, had. Yeah, 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 that's right. No, I worked two Nebraska games in my in my college career, though. Was that weird? Yeah, and I'm like, hey, send me to replace me on my crew send me you know just bring a different guy in i'll go to kansas and work and you know but they're like no 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 it's gonna be fine you go work that game and one of them i was actually a referee in but it was an early season non-conference game against some mcneese state yeah somebody like that and they're saying you'll be fine working there. i'm like still i'm in my home stadium I played here. Yeah, I'm a three year <laughs> letterman, and I gotta, you know, I gotta go to the the other team the head coach before the game and introduce myself and talk, and he knows everything. Just like there's just something about that to me that wasn't right, you know? Yeah. Because he still, yeah, you played it. We have zero now. We have zero chance. We know today because <laughs> you, know, you got this guy who's a, who's a letterman and he's a, the referee in the game. He's just like okay, but you know it just. It ended up working out. It was, you know, it was one of those blowout games. But at the end of the day, it was, yeah, it was weird. And so. Do you have relationships outside of the game with players or coaches now? Or are players allowed to say, like, I've been in, I've been in a car with John Higgins. And a head coach will call him on the way home just saying, hey, I need some clarification here. Talk to me. Talk to me. Do, is, is, is that allowed to happen? No. I would say no. Not with me anyway. Okay. I mean, I've, I've got, um, I'm trying to think there's any, I have probably I have two or three coaches, uh, no, they're assistant coaches in the league that have Nebraska ties that, okay. have, that have called me, not about a game, not about a call or anything else in the off season or whatever else, or said, Hey, here you, I see you're coming to town, you know, to our game this weekend, looking forward to see you. Yep, cool. Yeah, can't wait to see you too. We'll, I'll catch up to you before the game, kind of thing. But nothing, nothing of the sort where I would get a call from a head coach to discuss the game at all. I just okay. say, call New York. Okay. Call, New, call New York. Call New York. Because yeah. uh, it wouldn't be appropriate, I don't think, for me to do it. And really, the league is says they don't, they don't want us to do that. Yeah. It would seem rather frowned upon, I would think. Yeah, but that's the benefit. I, I'm serious. That's the benefit of being an employee of the National Football League, correct? As opposed to if you're a college basketball referee, yeah, but you're, you're, you're a 1099 the, employee. Right, right, right. Yeah, you're going somewhere else. But are you employed by the college? No, no, not not in college basketball. Okay. College basketball is even different than college football. So, where, yeah, because college football, it's it's you've yeah. got conference officials. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and, we're, and that's you, where John Higgins. You see John all over the country, man. Well, he takes a we're beating because he'll do five games in seven nights, and sometimes he'll be in the West Coast, <laughs> and next night he's over, and you know, and I mean, you probably remember when you were a doctor doing 14 to 18 hours a day, right? I'm dead 40. Yeah, I, I mean, so. <laughs> you mean in two days? Yeah, in well, that, yeah I mean, <laughs> straight. Yeah, yeah. For, you've done 40 hours straight, and but uh, he'll take a beating yeah, because. 36 to 40. But see, he'll take a beating if he's, you know, if he's in. Right. If he's in Texas one night 
in Columbus, Ohio, the next. Like, how how can you do that? Well, you yeah. Know, how you, can you be rested? How can you be ready to go? Well, how can we you be fresh? Blah blah blah. All that kind of. John's he's a machine man. He he's is. the best too. You know Kyle Debuse at all? We've had Kyle on the show. He's a big ten I mean, official. Yes, I know Kyle. Yeah, and then absolutely. Uh, uh, Kevin Marr is probably the next to go to the National Football League from this area, maybe? Or it, Potentially. It, yeah. Yeah. I don't, you know, that whole, we have no say in, in anybody coming in. You know, it's all the you know, New York office makes all those decisions on, on who, are, who are they basically scouting, who are they in the program, and who's on the list. Our, our, our association, so to speak, our NFL Referees Association has no say in who comes in at all. Have you watched any of the XFL or USFL? And will that, because you did the World League to get ready for the National Football League. Will today's officials go to the USFL, go to the XFL to, to get some of that pro experience? Because that's still going to be a faster game than what college is. Right. And I was watching the XFL yesterday. There were just a couple rules that I kind of liked, like kickoffs. You couldn't, nobody could move until the ball was caught. I mean, it, it's just interesting to see some of these rules to see if they get implemented in the National Football League to go, oh, we kind of like that. It's a little safer yeah. and, and see what that looks like. And I think that was a kind of somewhat of a discussion between XFL and the NFL relative to what would you like us to, to maybe try out? Here's what we're thinking about. Well, how can we tweak some stuff and everything else? And I, th I believe it. Uh, don't quote me. I don't know for sure, but I think there was some, some discussions on the, on, on the kick the kickoff rule, especially something like that. But uh, I haven't seen any of it. Okay. Yet. Is there an ability? I think it just started this yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday. yesterday. Okay. Yeah. Is there an ability on the, the part of NFL officials? One obviously, once Super Bowl's over, season's done. Can you guys go officiate in one of these other leagues, USFL, XFL, et cetera? Why would he take a pay cut? <laughs> well, no, I get that. I mean, it's well, and I guess what I wasn't sure is if you've got a guy who's okay, man, I need to brush up on some skills a little bit here. I got downgraded seven games this year on this particular right. situate these particular situations. Maybe I should go spend more time officiating. Are you allowed to do that as an NFL official with these other leagues? So I I believe, let me just say in that sense, because I believe um, but not, I don't know for sure. So I am, a, I am a member of a union. Our referees association at the NFL is a union and our union contracts with the NFL for our labor on Sunday afternoons. So are you an employee of the NFL or the union? The union. Okay. So I misspoke but, earlier. Well, yeah, technically yes, but, the, uh, but we're paid, we're all paid individually by the NFL. So it, it's not like the, I'm getting a check from our union. Okay. It's, it's through the NFL. And so there are restrictions. Weekly, on, monthly, biweekly? Yeah, biweekly. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't get anything in the offseason. Uh, automatic, the deposit. <laughs> yeah, automatic deposit? Automatic <laughs> deposit, yeah. <laughs> um, but in the offseason, nothing comes. I keep thinking. Oh, wait, Cash wait, flows wait, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there were restrictions. Um, that was a hard lesson for players to learn. <laughs> as a there was a time, actually, when, when a few of our game officials, younger game officials, um, they, the league worked with the Canadian Football League. And so some of those guys went uh. up to Canada, Canada and worked some of the Canadian games early before, actually before the NFL season started. So they might go up and work three or four weeks, you know, four, three or four games over a three or four week span um, just to get some additional experience at that too. I don't know what the XFL brings or what the USFL brings. I do know that some of our, what I'll term the end of the league's, developmental officials who are in that who are in that category of potentially being able to be brought in at any time now that we have uh, six open spots some of those guys are in gals also are working in um, in those leagues well, which is interesting because I, I think you would agree your world league experience was invaluable right i mean it was yeah. it was yeah. plus you got to travel for pretty cool yeah places. nfl europe i did you know, we did, that was going to be my question. Was it NFL Europe? Oh, see, or was I, yeah. it it's World all the League? same to me. Yeah, yeah. It was. This was NFL Europe days. Okay. So that was. I was there. Let's see, two thousand five, six, and seven. Okay. My my brother John played over. Okay. He John played in Berlin. Okay. Did he, oh yeah. So this. I mean, that would have been yeah. that would have been earlier. This would have been like ninety eight through two thousand. But it, it's interesting because I saw a stat, and I'm going to get it wrong, but I'm just paraphrasing. So now with the XFL and the USFL, there will be 
46 out of 52 weeks with professional football in the United States. I mean, that that's crazy. It shows you how much people love football, or at least they, they want to try to make it. Well, it's how much they want to try and sell for Yes, I don't know how exactly. many people are. I mean, everybody watches that at the start of the season. I'm not sure a whole lot of people keep watching right. XFL and USFL. Well, I was watching yesterday, <laughs> and I'm going to be honest. It took me – I just couldn't get into it. A, you don't know the players – and you can tell the talent level just from the XFL to the National Football League. I'd rather watch a college game over the XFL. So, I mean, it's just you don't really know anything. And you're like, ah, okay, it's, it's a novelty, five, ten minutes, and, and I'm good to go. So, Queen, did you, when you showed up, did you think you'd talk for an hour and 24 minutes? Are we an hour? <laughs> yeah, you, We're you, in. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you have, like, the, the honor of being, like, one of our longest podcasts. Oh, just right. <laughs> Good or bad? I'll no, take no, that, no. Uh, we could probably yeah. go for another, but I got to be respectful somewhat of your time. But uh, God, uh, it, it flew by though, didn't it? Absolutely flew by. So, yeah, this is information that to me is always insanely interesting. I mean, I loved it when we had debuts, and I love having you here because this is information that, yeah. even as a player who's played at a couple of different fairly high levels, man, I always learned something in terms of what you guys are looking at and how that works. Yeah. I don't know. It's kind of a, there's a little curtain pullback there that you get to see. So, so you mentioned the rules committee earlier, and here I go with another question. I was going to try to wrap this up. I, I mean, how often do you read the rule book, and when does the rules committee, and when do you have to get acclimated to make sure you know you're up to date on all those new rules? And are you reading the, during the season, are you reading the rule book nonstop? I, the answer there is yeah. I mean, I, usually I'll take a sat, like on Saturday night before I like shut, shut down and turn the lights off i'll usually just grab my rule book and just hit one rule just and just read may i not read the whole rule but it might be three pages of um whatever pass interference or roughing the passer or roughing the kicker or anything and i, I just do a i just kind of pull sometimes i just open a page and say okay what am i looking at now just so, as a review but but it's, it's a constant Roselle chapter it, three, verse four and five. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's a constant learning curve for the rule book. It's a, just a difficult book to begin with. And yeah, I usually, so now I kind of go, you know, just go free for, um, I usually start cracking, getting back into the rules, so to speak, in June ish. Okay. So I get a couple months just off, but doesn't mean I'm ever, I ever, I, you kind of never get away from the game itself. Or I mean, do you have it all memorized? I'd love to say, yeah, I got the whole book memorized, but it's, I think it's impossible. But there I have, I have, I have a working knowledge of it that I'm comfortable with, but it's a constant need to continue to review. If I just put the book down and didn't open and, you know, go back into it until September, it would be, I just, I wouldn't feel comfortable walking down that tunnel before a game going, I got this, right? I'm going yeah. to ask for a little vulnerability here. Because I used to, when, when I first started in television, I would practice, um, and this is back when I was 21, 22 years old, and I would always practice being in front of a camera, in front of a mirror. When you first got the white hat, did you practice in front of a mirror making your calls? Oh hell yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's still, uh, and I still have some, you know, some things before the game. I would kind of go in, uh, in the mirror in the locker room, do a couple of okay here, or there. all right, here we go, let's go. Okay, jerseys form fitted too, right? P tailored. Tailored, yeah. Tailored. Does everybody get them tailored now? I don't think they do probably should is, is there <laughs> is there like a pressure to like have a certain physique because you're ripped well I mean, is there a pressure to like i i gotta be i gotta be buff there is there is an expectation that the league has that your uh, fitness is a part of it and i say that because you gotta be in shape so you're other, not gonna be you're not gonna be a baseball it, umpire <laughs> yeah on the other side of it we have because it, it, it's part of your grading system for the year Really? Is, is yeah fitness and physique and how do you look basically is, is part of our grade wow and so there has been some in you know in the past there's been officials criticized because you're too heavy you know you're not moving like you should um you just you know you just don't look good in uniform that's 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 the reality of it so there's an expectation that like I said, again, it's a lot of visuals in the NFL and one of them is they want their they want us and our our, our entire staff to, to look the part, which I'm completely in agreement with. You know, it's a it should, we should. They want the product. It's part of my job. I, I tell people, 
I get up, I go work out in the morning because it's part of my job. So is there, I mean, you go down to Jerry Ryan, gentleman apparel and have him tailor your, your Jersey or is there somebody in the national football league that tailors <laughs> what you look like? No, I got a lady that I go to <laughs> locally though. Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh man. Every year. Every, so we get, we get new, a whole new box of jerseys um, and hats and apparel and everything else. Huge box comes in early, early July that uh, lands at my front door and, Take it down. Brand new uniform every year. So we go down. I go and she fits me up and sews it up. Even tailors the pants too? Yeah. Man. Yeah. That would be key. You got to run around in yeah. those things yeah. for three or four hours. Got to look good. <laughs> yeah. You got to look those. good. You yeah, want those part to of look good. You want them comfy. I wonder about how many guys you graded A, but your physique, you're just a little too frumpy. We're going to give you a D. You got straight A's <laughs> and a D. Knocked you down to a three point. Yeah, but I would imagine a big chunk of that is related to you've got to be able to move. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's got to yeah, be a big that's, bottom line. Well, actually, it's helping when I say it's part of my job to, to kind of look the part yeah. and be able to, to move and to, uh, and to fat, fat, deal a game. Whether it's people tend to not be quick. That would be me. <laughs> I, I remember I get calls. They're like, hey, Cleet's at the, at, at, the, uh, at the gym. He's running backwards on a treadmill. Why is he doing that? I go, because he runs backwards as an official, you <laughs> idiot. That's how you practice for it. True story. You know those. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Back in the day, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Time. That's good stuff. <laughs> Cleet, thanks thanks for stopping by uh, the basement. We, you know, yeah. Doug Ewald named this the speakeasy because he's like, you walk in your house and he's like, just normal house. You walk downstairs like this really. Yeah, it's just, good point. <laughs> I like it. Good point. So like we'll, we'll call it the speakeasy. Thank you for the glass of wine, too. Cheers. Very good. Cheers. Yeah. Uh, that's Cleet Blakeman, NFL official, former Husker. Uh, Dr. Rob Zadiska, he's, uh, he's always hanging out with us. Thanks, doctor. And congratulations on your daughter getting third third in the it was, state it was a good it was a good week uh, we're gonna put good pressure week. on it state it's state title next year and nothing girls wrestling gotta love I just, it i just i just keep telling people wrestle well make sure to uh reach out to our our lawyer uh sponsor which is connor or at orin horrigan uh 402-408-6488 or uh, contact it or in horrigan uh, dot com. Also, if you uh, are so inclined, uh, visit the uh, Betfred Sportsbook. Uh, download the app today. If you're in Iowa, Arizona, or Colorado, use the uh, the keyword Doc Talk to get a free twenty dollar bet. For Dr. Rob Zanis, I'm Travis Justice. We'll talk to you next time on the Doc Talk podcast, presented by Betfred Sports. Mm-hmm.